Welcome everyone, I am Andrew Duckworth and I'd like to thank you for joining us for our special festive edition podcast to round off our series for the year of 2020. And what a year it has been. The COVID-19 pandemic has without doubt been one of the most significant healthcare crises of our generation to date and has led to severe global healthcare and economic disruption and uncertainty. We've all faced huge challenges and here at the journal we hope to have provided support and information for both you as our community as well as the patients we care for as we've all tried to navigate these difficult and strange times over the past year. So to finish the year off today, I'm delighted to be again joined by our Editor-in-Chief here at the Journal, Professor Farah Sadrav. Over the next 20 to 30 minutes, will give us some insights into the past year, including the effects of the pandemic on us as a specialty and the research we do, and what we can expect and hopefully look forward to in 2021. Many thanks for joining us today, Prof. It's great to have you back with us. Great to be with you, Andrew, and thanks again for doing such a phenomenal job with the uh, podcast this year. We are very, very grateful at the Journal. I enjoy it every time, Prof. It's great to have you here. So, Prophet, just looking at the, uh, the year as a whole, as we've said, it's been a, been a very difficult year for our healthcare system, for the world in general, and our specialty, and also for our team here at the Journal. What do you feel have been the biggest challenges, and, and how have we sort of faced those and, and adapted over the past year? You know, I, mean, I think starting with the Journal, you know, we have a, an outstanding team at the Journal, from particularly the publishing and the management team, but also our editorial board, and then you know, a wider community. And, you know, it's been a, a huge stress for everybody at a personal level, worrying about themselves, worrying about their families and adjusting to a different way of working. And our team has been phenomenal in that, you know, the process, the work at the journal has gone on seamlessly, even though everyone has transitioned to working from home. There have been no face-to-face -face meetings. We've created a virtual environment where we've worked extremely hard. And the, the production team and, you know, Emma Bodden, Richard Hollingworth, have got everybody in a great cultural space. They're all working very hard. And to compound all of that, because of COVID and people perhaps not operating as much or not being in clinic as much, we've seen a huge increase in the number of papers. So you know, this year with first time submissions and then resubmissions, we will have processed over 3000 papers. So the core team has worked phenomenally hard. And you know, I need to thank them and I, I do regularly but I think at this time of year a huge thanks goes out to all of them and also to all our specialty editors and board members who've really carried the weight of the workload with the journal and in spite of everyone's uncertainty and you know not knowing what's going to happen as we move forward. No absolutely Prof and like I say it's just been a phenomenal amount of submissions and would you say with, with that Prof we've discussed it before but has, do you think the quality has gone up because you know we've had so much research come through do you think we're maybe rejecting things that we wouldn't have done in the past because we've had so many submissions? So you know I think that's a, that's a great question we tried not to change the level of the bar but I think you're right we've accepted more than we would normally accept so our acceptance percentage has stayed the same Mm -hmm. So you'll find the issues in, the, in early 2021 slightly bigger than normal because we've had more good material. But you know, a couple of other things have happened. I think one of the, the big drives during my time as editor has been to push towards more methodologically sound work. And nationally and internationally, we're seeing better quality research in trauma and orthopedics. Be that RCTs or better looks at big data or more robust cohort studies, we are seeing better research coming through across the specialties, which is fantastic. So I think that's raised the pressure to accept more. And we've, we've also had the bonus of the arrival and growth in 2020 of Bone and Joint Open, our gold open access sister journal, which has really just only started in January, yet now is well established and has allowed us to uh, find a home for those methodologically sound papers that are worthy of publication, but just don't fit in the BJJ. So it's been great to put those there, uh, to put a whole load of protocols uh, in there as well, some systematic reviews, and also uh, put a whole load of COVID work there during the year. I mean, it has really been an, an amazing year for the BJJ, hasn't it? I mean, I think when we all started, we had high hopes for it, but I think it, it'd be fair to say, I'm sure you'd agree, it's surpassed our expectations really, hasn't it, in many ways? Oh, without doubt. So we started in January. We will, by the end of this year, have published more than 107 papers, I think. And, and these are all methodologically sound papers or papers that are very topical and of good interest to our readership. It's got really a rising interest on the web. 
good altmetric scores and it's now on PubMed, it's indexed, yeah. which is great for the, you know, our uh, authors who've submitted, had them accepted, and now they find their papers are on PubMed already within a few months. I think that's tremendous. So it's been a lot of hard work in the background from the editorial team. I should flag up that Alice Little's now joined me as a specialty editor, helping out with BJO. So I'm grateful for his help. But again, the publishing team has supported us strongly. And I hope our readers are enjoying reading BJO as well as BJJ. Absolutely, Prof. And I think, like you say, I think particularly at the beginning of the year, it was a really good outlet for, and, and, a, and a fast outlet to get some of our COVID-related research out that we were receiving. But if we go on to sort of the COVID research from where we were back in maybe March, April time, how's that developed? How, what is your role as editor? How, how have you seen that develop over the past year? And what do you feel like the, maybe the key messages have been? And, and where, where do we need to go if we need to go next? Yeah, I mean, it's like any journey that is bumpy, and unpredictable that there it starts off with people wanting to describe what they're seeing and uh you know quick observational little things that came out and that really was everyone was seeking information any tiny bits of information from countries that were exposed to it early or from early experiences so whoever was able to collect quick data and quick observations those were the things we were seeing at the beginning then centers started coming together research groups starting to put some rigor around it and we started to really understand what happens to the trauma patient in a covid environment uh, and, and that you know that gave us some really good data and some really good insights and then we really moved on after our specialty really came to a halt in terms of elective work during the the height of the pandemic and the first lockdown we suddenly started to look at, you know, what is it like to live with COVID? How are we going to reintroduce elective surgery? What is safe and what isn't? And again, we moved through that. And then now we're on to really trying to understand what the impact is going to be, what the system change that will result from COVID will be. And there'll be a, a whole load of health service related research. And one of my challenges for the journal will be to pick the few things that really will make a difference to the thinking and the clinical practice of our orthopedic community that are relevant from that point of view. So BJO has been a great rapid outlet for, for the COVID work. We haven't published that much in the main journal, but just some key messages and uh, some highlight front matter just to really keep people up to date with what we're thinking, what we're doing, what's going to pass and what's going to stay. Yeah, that's really interesting, Prof. And I think, so, you know, in terms of looking forward, you, you think that it, the main thing will be is as we do reintroduce more of our services, particularly our elective services, it's knowing how those pathways and the effectiveness of those pathways are going to be. Do you think that's probably going to be the key in the, in the next year? So, uh, I think that, that'll, that'll be part of it. I think there's a few things that COVID really flushed out. The first one is that there's very little data out there on the impact of prolonged waiting on our patients and on their outcomes. And so, that's one fertile area of research that I know several uh, groups have now started looking at. I think it's, it's flushed out that as a community in trauma and orthopedics, we have to compete for space with other surgical specialties. And so getting our prioritization right, working out when we really do need to intervene early, even in things like arthroplasty cases, that there are some parts of the country where arthroplasty is still defined as low priority work and not making it in and I, I know that's true worldwide as well so it's really important that we make the case for our patients and collect the data around that and then as you suggested very rightly there are fundamental pathway changes that have occurred as a result of covid and that we need to understand that those work for our patients that they lead to good outcomes and make sure that we embed those that work well and go back from the ones that don't yeah no absolutely prof yeah i totally agree so if we're to sort of move on from COVID research, the other thing to highlight to our listeners, and I know, I know a lot of them will be aware, but just maybe the hip and knee supplements from this year, you know, as many of our reason listeners will know, for the months of June and July, we published two supplements that contain some really uh, great high quality papers from the American Hip and Knee Society Club meeting. So Prof, just, you know, what do you feel have been the benefits, you know, so far to the readership uh, of those supplements? I mean, there, there is some really great work in there, isn't there? These are two societies that uh, really in, engender high quality research and high quality interactions. And we've entered into a three year cycle with them. So the publications that we'll see in 2021 will be the third of those three years uh, to, to see whether those supplements really give us some high quality work and 
give us visibility for the excellent other work that's in the Bone and Joint Journal in North America. And thus far, it's been extremely successful. So we've seen some really high quality research, some interesting thought provoking work, and we've developed a greater insight into what North America is doing, which inevitably has an impact on, on the rest of the world. So at the moment, we're all uh, working very hard, reviewing and editing all those submissions and uh, the three award papers for HIP and the three award papers for me and the rest of the supplements, which are those papers that have passed the peer review bar should be with our readers in June and July, respectively. We typically see a few more knee papers than hip papers. So that's been a very rewarding partnership for us so far. It's something that uh, we get to revisit after this three-year cycle. And you know, we'll see if it's served its purpose or if it's something we need to move forward with. Absolutely. And do you feel when you look at the type of and the research and the topics that are covered, do you see that mirrored in the main journal as well? There, there, there are sort of submissions we're seeing from maybe more UK or other parts of the world. I think there, there is a parallel and often we do follow those trends. So, you know, there are problems that are picked up. There are questions that are asked where the North Americans lead the way. And yet, you know, in reality, there are lots of things where we lead the way, be that in the UK or in Europe. Or, or elsewhere. So it, it really is important to be global in our outlook. I think that's one of our strengths is we are really open to the whole breadth of trauma and orthopedics. And we truly want to be global because there are things to be learned from the current problems, the current research, the current thinking in every continent. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more, Prof. So Sort of moving on then, we've picked a few just papers from the year that have been published over the past year that we just wanted to very briefly highlight and discuss. And, and we've sort of deliberately not picked some of the excellent COVID papers we've published in both the BJJ and the BJO because obviously we've just discussed those. But the first paper we we're just going to briefly mention was the paper by Tahir et al. and their multi-center RCT, which compared clinical outcomes to patients with open tibial fractures. And they compared standard versus negative pressure wound therapy. And it's, it's an interesting study because it's very much consistent. The results are very consistent with the results from the large multi-center UK trial, WOLF, which was run by Matt Costa out of Oxford, which found no real benefit across the wide range of outcomes for negative pressure wound therapy. What, what made you pick that paper, Prof? Is there anything in particular you sort of wanted to highlight from it? Well, look, I was really excited to see a paper from a less affluent country where we've managed to embed an RCT across multiple centers that was methodologically done well. So yeah. that, I think that's something to be truly proud of. Yeah. So just to see that come out from those authors was wonderful in itself. To then mirror the outcome of the Wolf study and Matt Costa's work is important because I don't think one RCT is enough for most things. We really need to have credible evidence that follows that primary evidence that really will ultimately lead us to change practice. And, and here we are, we've got two RCTs that are going against what surgeons and industry are, are pushing for. So, so I think this is really important to take seriously. And it's a good example that you can execute good quality RCTs wherever you are in the world. And, yeah. and that, you know, that's something as a journal that we are pushing for. And, and you know what, I think we're pushing North America. We've raised the bar. North America is going to have to follow with good quality, methodologically sound RCT. So I congratulate these authors. I think they've done a wonderful job. No, I couldn't agree more, Prof. And I think, like you say, it's a very methodologically sound, well-run trial. Um, and I think it's, it, it is interesting how much it does mirror Wolf, you know, in, from a, a different healthcare system, a different, I would imagine, a different range of trauma they probably see than we do, but very similar findings. And I agree, it's a real a really, really great paper. And if, if we sort of move on that, that was one of our, the RCTs, you know, the other paper we were going to just touch upon uh, was the NJR study from the team in Wrightington. Obviously, we get a lot of big, we're getting more and more big data studies, data from the NJR and other, other alike. And this was sort of looking at the use of antibiotic loaded bone cement and the risk of revision after total hip replacement. Uh, and they found an association between the use of antibiotic loaded cement and reduced PGI revision rates or infection revision rates. It, you know, I think it's difficult, difficult with the big data sometimes, Prof. They're not always designed to answer the question they ask, but it was a great study of this, wasn't it? No, and th this is a nice study. And, you know, as many of our listeners and readers are aware, I've been critical over the years of the misuse of big data. You know, <laughs> the data was not designed necessarily to answer those questions. But there are times when 
the question needs to be addressed. And in this case, there's been a massive challenge about the use of antibiotic cement for a whole load of reasons, including cost and the fact that it hasn't been popular in certain parts of the world uh, until recently. Mm. And there's a message here that we've known from the Swedish registry and elsewhere for years, but that needed uh, restudying, reinforcing a new look with uh, modern data. And, you know, this group has, to their credit, done a, a great job of looking at our registry and trying to unpick that. They've recognized the strength and the limitations. They've pretty much followed the advice we gave in the journal with the search guidelines that we put out in February this year with the help of Ben Oliver and Dan Perry to, to really try and get some methodological rigor mm. into the data study. So I think it's, it's important that for any question that we're trying to answer, we use the best data. And I think to answer this question, the registries are a great repository and resource and they, they, they've done a great job and we should encourage people to continue using antibiotic loaded cement in hip arthroplasty. Yeah, I think, I think that's an interesting point, Prof, isn't it? As, as we've said, you know, RCTs, they're definitely a gold standard in many ways. And not to give the game away for our listeners, but next month we'll be talking to Mike Whitehouse about a paper that he's got coming out in January, which looks at a very similar question, but in hip and knee replacement, there's a big meta analysis that, that's there. And in some ways, you know, an RCT in this area would be great, but it would require a huge amount of, of patience. Um, it would be very costly. Um, and even though it would be great to run, it's whether you'd have the equipoise from the surgeons, because it, like, you know, we've said before, you know, how many patients would you be willing to give antibiotics meant to to prevent one infection? <laughs> that number would be pretty big in most of our eyes. It's interesting is it's, well, like you say, it's the question we're asking and, and the method by which we can answer it best, isn't it? I, I, absolutely. I think they, this is a, a good example of where we are seems to work. Let's not change practice in this case. Absolutely. Absolutely. And finally, Prof, just sort of moving on to the last paper, um, it's like a different paper, you know, to the first two. This was from Nottingham, uh, which is a really interesting perspective study, looking at 260 patients with suspected cordial equinus syndrome. And they looked at the sort of diagnostic performance characteristics of the various clinical signs and highlighting the value in particular of using post-voiding residual banner volume of greater than or equal to 200 mils, they found as the most accurate predictor in uh, determining patients with cordial equinus syndrome. Quite an interesting study, very much different methodology to the first two, but a really interesting message in many ways. I think this is a valuable message for the practicing clinician. It, it is something that will help with evaluation of patients. It uses simple metrics and yet gives us a way of predicting. It will save money to a certain extent. And it's something that makes sense to most orthopedic surgeons seeing patients acutely. And it also illustrates that, you know, the, Mike Griffith and this group have set out, they've thought about what they were going to look at and they've looked at it and it is a, a great credit to them. And what, you know, when we move in a world of multi-center randomized studies and big data, it is still possible from a well-organized unit to produce some good research that will change thinking and change practice. And, you know, I like that sort of thing. And I also, you know, like to highlight the fact that we do publish some very good spine papers, some very good pediatric papers, some good upper limb papers in the journal. Uh, you know, we get a lot of good trauma and hip and knee work, but actually we cover the full spectrum. Absolutely, Prof. No, I couldn't agree more. So uh, you know, moving on, Prof, and maybe just to finish up, looking ahead to the new year and looking at the future, what do you feel are the sort of positives we can take forward as we head into next year? And hopefully with some hope on the horizon, you know, the vaccine is coming, uh, we're told. <laughs> and you know, what do you think are going to be the positives ahead and maybe the challenges ahead over the next year? You know, it, it, everyone's been through a tough year. Whichever way you look at it, it's, it's been tough. None of us expected this year to be as it has been. But in, in, in reality, we have learned a lot from it. Uh, I think our community has been phenomenal, both in terms of its resilience and in how it's served our patients. And we're going to have a, a massive workload to deal with. We're going to have to get back on with our teaching and training and get back on with our research. And uh, we're going to have to learn from this. And I think it will change. We will have better communication virtually. We're going to have to look at new ways of educating. And I think we'll refocus our research to things that really matter in this brave new world we're going into. It's still going to be a bumpy year yeah. next year whilst we get people vaccinated, whilst we see if that works, whilst we get back on with our surgery and get our hospitals working, get our efficiency levels back up. So I think we need to be mindful of the fact there are still some, some challenges ahead, but there's at least there's optimism in the air and compared to the darkness of the first half of the year I think we are we should be looking forward to 2021 and from a you know from a journal perspective uh, you know we're immensely grateful to our entire team 
it, at the journal, but actually our entire community, our reviewers, our readers, uh, our authors, all of whom are contributing and continue to contribute. And we hope that everybody will be able to celebrate the holidays in some way or other, and that they will look forward positively to 2021 and that we will all be able to communicate together and help each other through 2021. Absolutely, Prof. I think that's a, a really nice note to finish on. Thank you so much, Prof. An excellent overview as ever, and, and, uh, and it's really been informative and uh, always great to talk to you. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. And finally, as ever, we would like to wish all of our listeners and the wider community a, a very happy festive period and all the very best for 2021. We at The Journal, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Stay safe and well, and thanks for listening. <laughs>